and welcome to another class. Um, again, we're welcoming everybody that uh, is joining us. Um, I always notice, especially as we put this up on uh, YouTube, um, we're starting to get a lot of international uh, visitors and we're, we're welcome to have everybody on board with uh, uh, what we're doing. Now, uh, today I wanted to start as we're talking about finding peace amidst chaos. Um, I'm finding an interesting trend. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a, I'm a licensed counselor. And so I, all through the week, I'm seeing a lot of people. And uh, early on in here in the pandemic, um, th there was a lot of fear and anxiety when it came to what do we expect from Corona and how bad is it going to be and, and where do we go from here. And, um, and, we were, and we were always kind of working through all of those kind of dynamics. Now, uh, as, we are, as, as we're recording this today, we're, we're just kind of concluding what has been a very tumultuous uh, and divisive presidential election uh, in the course of the country. Um, and as with all of the uncertainty and chaos associated with that, I've now been getting people in my office that from both sides of the aisle that are anxious and worried what will happen to the country if the other guy wins. And again, from both sides of the aisle worried about what the other side is going to do if they should win or if they should lose. In the long run, there is always this worry about uncertainty. If we have a hard time knowing what to expect down the road and knowing what to plan for, that can be a, a, a scary thing. Our comfort level and our ability to trust and to make plans and to be at peace is so often based in uh, knowing what's coming, what I can do to prepare for it, and then having a plan in place should that uh, not happen. Now, for those of you uh, watching this, some of you are more comfortable with uncertainty and chaos, and some of you become a lot more concerned with uncertainty and chaos, and to the point of almost like a clinical anxiety if you're not able to know exactly what is coming next. And certainly we have been in this season of, of an election cycle where there has never really been a, a lot known about what is coming before, during, after, and we're having to sit kind of in that midst of, of chaos and figure out what is our body telling us about how we're responding to the fact that I don't know or I don't know what to expect is coming next. And, and as I was thinking about it today, the, um, that presents a pretty good lead in to, to what we've been uh, talking about. We've been, going, we've been talking about Enoch and Melchizedek and, and the fact that they held the order of Enoch and the ability to control the elements and all of that. Well, we're about to meet another person that was of the order of Enoch, and we'll talk a little bit more probably about that next week than we're going to talk about it uh, today. But in talking about Noah and looking at what happened around the events of um, the, the flood, I think we have to take a big step back uh, and first of all take a look at um, when we talk about uh, the, the creation of the, of the world. Now, if we simply take a look at the, the facts that we have, and then we'll kind of put an interpretation on the top of that. Um, this becomes kind of interesting when we say, and if we go to Moses 2, and it says the earth was without form. You, you read that chaos. That's certainly how the Hebrews read uh, the, the early stages of creation as a chaos. The earth was without form and void, and I caused darkness to come up um, upon the face of the deep. Now, when we think about void, we're thinking about a space where things, there's nothing there. It, it, it's a nothingness. That's, that's a void. 
The Lord has just told you that this void is not an empty void. Because he's going to say, I cause darkness to come up upon the face of the deep. And uh, my spirit, which is ruach, uh, which is interesting in a creative process, that this is a female uh, noun, ruach. My, my spirit moved upon the face of the water. So this, so start off with the idea that this void where the, the, the Lord is going to start his creative process in a void, but it's not an empty void. It actually is full of water. Everything is going to come from the water. And again, in, in uh, Hebrew mythology, the waters are about chaos. Everything came out of chaos. Everything was created out of chaos. Now, uh, and, and think about in some of the uh, Hebrew mythology as well, there were leviathons and serpents that would come up out of the chaos and destroy things. It's one of the reasons why it is that Israelites were never a great um, seagoing people like like uh, some of the others that they would uh, that they would have to interact with, especially when you start getting into the Greeks and the Romans, uh, the Carthaginians, who were all very much seagoing people. Israelites were not. Part of it because of kind of a superstition and a fear of the chaos of the deep and the waters and what might come up out of there that might be destructive. Uh, and it, a lot of it has its roots back in this, in this creative process that things start with water. And everything that God creates is going to be brought forth out of water. Uh, and, and notice that he then goes from, the, the Spirit will then move across the face of the water, and then what happens? Well, God is going to then do several things. As it comes up out of the water, he's then going to start to separate and organize. And interesting that in, in uh, modern revelation, the word is actually commands. I commanded the waters. I commanded the dry land. And he's going to be commanding these things, and they're going to obey. But part of what he's doing, he's now going to separate and organize. He's going to separate the water and the dry land, the, the sun from the moon, from the stars. He's going to separate the animals. He's going to separate the, the fishes. Um, and in separating, he's also diversifying, which I think is another fascinating idea about the fact that when he says, I'm going to create animals, he didn't say, well, I'm going to create a dog, uh, the same dog, and they'll only be this same dog over the whole earth. Think about all the varieties of dogs. And then all the variety of snakes, or birds, or fish, or giraffes. Uh, so in that separation, and then that there's a variety and a diversification to bring beauty and variety to the earth in diversity. Lovely idea. Uh, and but with all of the as he's organizing, how does he organize it? Well. There, we get a little bit of a hint in DNC one, where the Lord says, um, "Knowing the calamities and the evil designs that are going to exist in the hearts of men in the last days, I, the Lord, gave them commandments." His organization, his uh, planning, and we're going to find out, and his safety exists in taking the chaos separating it where it needs to be, and then giving it laws and commandments. And, and it's in these laws that there is safety. Because it is these laws, as will turn out, are really based on the idea of the ultimate safety will be, you will do those things that will bring you back into my presence. Uh, that's the ultimate safety. But he's going to organize them with, with laws. Now, 
the fall with Adam and Eve was simply about breaking a law. They had been given laws to multiply and replenish, but they were also given a law not to eat of the, of the fruit. Uh, but they do it anyway. And, and, and the breaking of the law, that institutes... Uh, the Lord then implements a premortal plan, meaning that it was planned for when they partake of the fruit. There is a premortal plan for an atonement, and we will provide a Savior for them, as we've already talked about. We're prepared for this. Because when, because part of the, the plan will be recognizing the fallibility and the criticalness that they that they transgress this law so that it implements the plan and so the Lord is ready for them when the plan gets uh, violated and and so now in the in the fall the plan begins to move forward and what we find out is and as a result of all of this, a second thing happens. First, when they fall, there will be a plan implemented. And as they begin to live the law and they go out into the into the lone and dreary world and they begin to experience things with their kids and struggles and, and all of those kind of things, when the angel comes back to them in, Mo, in, in uh, Moses uh, 8 and says, uh, here's, here's the plan, and make sure that you are sacrificing, and this is in the uh, the similitude of the only begotten of the Father, and all of that. And Adam and Eve's response is is, is wonderful because it says that we can now see. Blessed be the name of God, Adam says, and Eve is going to say it in her way. For because of my transgression, my eyes are open. We partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, uh, we have become like the gods and we have tasted the bitter so we know to cherish the sweet. Our eyes are opened. How important the sweet is and how bitter the bitter is. And that knowledge and that understanding will prepare them forward and help teach uh, th that next generation of the teachers of righteousness that we're going to talk about <coughs> again um, more next week as Noah joins that group. The teachers of righteousness who are going to teach the plan of the atonement, and that by doing so that your eyes will then be opened and you will then have knowledge. You'll be able to see going forward. And that vision becomes critical because God's see. God has vision that we don't have. And the purpose of the plan is to enable us to see the things that he sees. Uh, at that point, then, we have become like God, knowing, seeing, understanding good and evil, and choosing good because we knew the difference. Okay, So that's the creation. And now they begin to move forward and, and, uh, and hopefully and teach people to stay within the organization, within the laws that uh, the Lord has given them. But as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, uh, the wheels pretty much come off pretty fast, right? Uh, the, Genesis 6 says, And the Lord said, If you guys keep doing what you're doing, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And in talking to Noah, he's actually saying, If they are going to continue to do this, I will take my breath from them. I will remove my spirit. And, and then he says, And God saw that wickedness of man was great upon the earth, um, so he's going to have to move. Well, what is it that he's going to do as the wickedness, and in this case the wickedness is over and over and over, uh, them using the Mahan plan to say, we're going to shed blood to get property. That's how this will work. And if 
if the, the blood of righteous Abel was crying out to God, now we get over and over and over all of the blood of all of the people being slain so that somebody else can have property. Uh, as the Mahan plan is in full gear and people are being completely wicked. And, and the Lord's response in watching all of this is to now say, and, and that every imagination of thoughts in their heart was on evil continually. <sighs> what do we do? What do we do when we get to this point where laws are so flaunted and so broken where do, where do we go from here? Well, the plan that is implemented is one that has been, is certainly up for debate. And we're going to talk about it a little bit today. Uh, because basically, what, what he's going to say here is, in Moses, if men do not repent, I will send the floods upon them. Ah, the floods. Depending on how we have looked at this scripture, particularly the flood and Noah, is open to an awful lot of interpretation. And part of our problem is that so often in the scriptures, we have a hard time distinguishing between what is the symbol and what is the symbolized. When we, are, when we, when we go to church and we are partaking of the sacrament, and we're told we're going to bless this bread, or we're going to bless this water. We're not seeing it as bread. It's, the bread is a symbol of what is being symbolized, the, the body of Christ, or the blood. This isn't really blood. This is, this is water, but it symbolizes the blood. Now, and obviously some churches have got caught up in what is literal and what is figurative. But this idea of the symbol and the symbolized is a hard thing to, to go back and, and try and understand. Now sometimes when we have looked at the flood, especially when we're looking at, at statements coming out of the brethren in the 19th century, uh, Orson Pratt and uh, uh, Orson Hyde and and Party P. Pratt, these guys were products of their age, which was very, very literal. They saw things as literal. So when they take a look at the flood, their understanding is that they're going to immediately see a worldwide flood, and it had to be a worldwide flood. Why? Because they were saying, well, that... It, the, the earth is now being baptized, so it has to be total immersion. Why? Because men are done with total immersion, so the earth will be done with total immersion, because that's how it works. And then, well, oh, what, men get the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, so the earth will get the gift of the Holy Ghost later. Uh, and that, that idea of this total immersion uh, and, and that this is a baptism of the earth has persisted even into uh, statements from other leaders uh, up to the present day. Now, here's the problem with that. We don't know if that's true or not. It could very well be that the flood was a total immersion. It could very well be that the Lord intended it to be symbolic of a baptism of the earth. But somewhere in that, that debate... There's a possibility also that it, it wasn't and that it's being symbolic of something else. And so I want to I give you an idea of how this would have been looked at in the first century, at the time of Christ, and also certainly seen by Israelites uh, and Jews permanently. How did they look at what was actually occurring with Noah and, and the great deluge, the, the flood, and hear how they looked at it. And then, then we can, then, then perhaps for us, and, and my goal today is to not end up getting into a debate about whether or not it was total immersion or not, or whether it was a regional flood, or, you know, in a sense, when we get caught up in all of that, we're, we're missing the symbol 
of what is really being symbolized and getting caught up in minutia. And it's the same battle we get into about saying, was the earth created in six days or 6,000 years or, or six creative periods or something? And we spend all of our time trying to do all of that and, and not see the power of what exactly is being symbolized here. Uh, and in this case, if, if we go back, uh, I, uh, uh, a more powerful way, I think, to look at it is set those kind of arguments aside, since we really don't know this deep into antiquity and the, the amount of times that the Old Testament, especially Genesis, has been touched and edited over time. But the symbolism should jump out at us and should be unmistakable. And this is where the greatest application is. What does this mean to us in our life? How important is this to us? Well, it was the flood. Well, no, there is a very powerful thing that is going to land home with us. And this is the part I think we need to see. And that is that uh, ancient Judaism would have seen uh, the, the flood as a second creation. There is the first creation. And then look what's going to happen here. Laws are being broken. Men are becoming more and more wicked and evil and shedding blood and all of that. So these laws are being broken. And the, the Lord is going to declare that the water, the, the void, the water of creation in some measure is going to return. Whether it was a regional flood or a total immersion doesn't matter. The Lord is saying, I'm going to recreate the earth. And I'm going to recreate mankind. Now, sometimes that's looked at it in the Bible. The Old Testament, King James Version, says that God repented of the idea that he'd made God. It's like, or that he'd made men. He's like, I can't believe uh, I, I made a mistake. I'm going to start over. Uh, Joseph Smith translation corrects that to say that Noah repented of the fact that God had created man because they were so wicked and evil. As if they all looked at it and said, wow, did we make a mistake? Rototill the garden and start over. We can't believe it. And so much of Christianity, by the way, really believes that Adam and Eve really screwed up the program that there was a catastrophe that occurred in the garden and that Christ's atonement was to fix the great mistake made by Adam and Eve. And as we're looking at the Old Testament through modern revelations, we're saying this went according to plan. The, the Lord knew what he was doing, including this second creation. He knew what was going to come. He was sad that men were doing what they were doing, but he wasn't repenting or mourning of the fact that he'd made man at all. He was mourning, he was repenting the fact, and we have it in, in Moses 7 as he's watching these events with Enoch, that his, his sadness about what he had to do at whatever scale and limit it was, that there would be pain and suffering as a result of this recreation that had to happen. There would be remorse. And hang on to that idea that remorse comes with second creation. The earth is literally being recreated. It's being returned to the, um, the void. It's being re returned to the waters. Okay? Now, how's that going to, th how does this recreation work? Well, uh, as it's being recreated, it's going to be saved by a plan. And the plan is going to be to Noah build an ark. And, and as he's given the directions on the ark, and again, I don't want to get into, was there two animals or seven, or, you know, did it look like the Jaredite barges, or was it more like, you know, maybe Nephi's boat that might have, you know, who knows. Don't get caught up in the symbol. 
Look at the symbolization that is happening here. Okay, he's saying the earth is being created, and 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 what's going to happen as this flood comes, and I have recreated and I brought the void. Then what's going to happen is I'm going to bring forth out of the flood recreated mankind and a recreated plan. And what does the plan look like? Well, this ark, the, the, the people are going to survive because they're going to be able to ride in, in an ark that is going to be protected by, by pitch. And this pitch, this, this blacky tar substance on the inside uh, especially and, and, and on the outside, uh, the, the, the Hebrew word for pitch is kafar, which is fascinating for the fact that that is the root word also for kapor, covering, kapor, atonement. That when they wear a kaput, a hat, Okay, that is a covering over their head. But the idea of uh, Kippur covering uh, the, the, uh, the Day of Atonement is, is Yom Kippur. It is the day we are covered with an atonement. And we're saved as a result of that. And, we're gonna, and in a sense, those that were in the ark were being rescued from the void, rescued from the flood rescued from the heartache of some of the recreation that was going on. And by the way, and that, that harkens back to another one of the uh, Order of Enoch people, Moses, who was going to be saved from Pharaoh's um, edict by riding in a small ark covered with pitch and that he was going to then be raised uh, by the Egyptians until he realized who he was. And then he would have a second creation as Moses, not as the son of Pharaoh. It's another recreation uh, parable almost that happens with Moses' early life. Okay, So uh, those that are in the ark are saved because they are saved by uh, on that Yom Kippur, on that day of atonement uh, uh, riding above the void. What's the other thing that, that they're going to have available to them? Remember for Adam and Eve, one, they're given a plan. Number two, they're given vision. They can now see uh, better than they did prior. Do the, does Noah have better vision? Yes, and it's really subtle. If you look in, in uh, Genesis, it talks about the fact that the Lord told him to create a window. Well, the window that they can see through is called, it's a tzofar, okay? Well, tzofar could mean a window that lets light in. But fascinating for Latter-day Saints, tzofar also can be small, shining stones uh, that enable them to see light. And immediately the Jaredite story ought to jump uh, fully to light for you, the brother of Jared, that in a sense, when the Lord says, when, when, when uh, the brother of Jared says to the Lord, we don't want to cross the water in darkness. And the Lord says, what will you do? And he says, well, you know, come up with the idea. Well, they lived at the time where they actually might possibly have certainly known about uh, Noah and the ark, might even as they traveled north, might even have seen the ark. And what the brother of Jared comes back with is the idea of the Lord touching shiny stones so far uh, and so again this is one of those things that we don't know he because he talks about having things these things uh, by the way another current uh, scholar that I was just listening to this week looks at that and says it's interesting that when the Lord refers to things in the scriptures he generally is referring to scriptures 
So some of those glowing stones might have been the word of God that they could read and that would give them light and knowledge. That's, that's a pretty fascinating idea. But you're going to get an idea that if you just pull back just a little bit, that what's going to happen as they're being saved from the chaos, they're being able to be saved by uh, on a Yom Kippur, but they're also going to be able to see so far. They're going to be able to see through a window, and that might have been just a window with shutters where they can see the ocean view from their porthole. But more likely, it is that they're able to see in darkness into shining stones that might give them idea of what's going on and might also be teaching them the gospel uh, as, as seers who look into stones can do. Uh, there's so much about this we don't know other than the fact that Noah comes through this with greater uh, sa being saved and also with greater light and knowledge. Now... What's the application to all of this? Why is it that we're going to kind of we're kind of taking more of a master view of this? And I think it's because the power of this lies deeply in in the application uh, as it should for us. And that is, take a look at our great plan of happiness as the Lord instituted this great plan of happiness. It's based on the idea that that like the earth. Uh, like Adam and Eve, we had a first creation. We were, we were born into mortality and we were given laws to prevent slipping into our own spiritual chaos. If you'll teach my commandments, I will bring you peace. Break the commandments and you won't find the peace that, that you're looking for. Okay, So we come into mortality, we're given laws to prevent chaos. What happens? Well, we're human. We break the laws. We just do it. And we do it on a regular basis. And, and we repent and then we do it again. And we, or then we find, we're creative and we find other laws to break. Um, we just do it. Uh, think about as parents when your kids are, you know, you tell them not to do stuff and then they do it. And then we ask the dumbest of all parental questions of all. How come you did that? You know, and a four year old is going to look at you and go, I don't know. I don't know. What, what's a 14 what's a year old going to say to you? How come didn't you think, didn't you think we would find out what were you thinking? And they go, I don't know. I, you know, I wasn't the the I didn't know. No, mom and dad, I really wasn't thinking. I just wanted what I wanted more than keeping the laws. I don't know. So, what happens is the Lord gave us laws. We break the laws, and then what does He do? Well, the idea is in our own personal creation that we then have a second creation. We're going to have that second creation is planned. We're born into mortality after either eight years, if we're born into the church, or whatever long until we're actually converted. And then what happens? We rise from the waters. We're placed down into the void, down into the waters. And the idea is that we're going to then be raised up out of the waters of baptism into a new creation. We have been recreated. We actually have a new parentage. parentage. I mean, we are sons and daughters of Christ. But we're going to be uh, brought forward into a new creation. We're going to rise from the waters of baptism to a waiting ark that was prepared for us. This ark of the atonement, the kafor. I mean, it's there for us, the kafor. To, to keep us safe from the chaos around us. And then uh, we're then able to see better through the window, the, the light of the Holy Ghost that is then going to provide a window for us to, know, to be able to see afar, see what's coming know how to protect ourselves if we're willing to follow that uh, guideline and we're willing to follow the promptings as we look through the window and and hopefully the second creation is enough of a grief and a sorrow 
that enables us more to be able to want to follow and to do the things that, that we're seeing. Now, um, let me kind of uh, move towards finishing this with uh, actually a, a thought that comes out of uh, the Lord speaking to Jeremiah. And this is just prior to uh, the des destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And remember, Jeremiah, uh, along with Lehi, is preaching for a long time, and then he's going to, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, and they are captured and taken off to Babylon. Prior to that, the Lord is going to teach Jeremiah a, a real great object lesson that I think Jeremiah then tried to teach to the Israelites who didn't really want to hear it anyway. But it's such a beautiful image of part of what we've been talking about with the recreation of the flood and our own personal recreation with our own baptismal waters that are going to make us into a new creation. Um, Jeremiah 18 says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there are, I will let you hear my words. I want to teach you something. Go down to the potter's house and listen to what I tell you while you're in this wonderful little object lesson. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. So imagine Jeremiah just kind of watching the potter. Now what happens a lot of times with uh, potters working at the wheel, <coughs> if the mix of the clay isn't quite right or it gets a little bit off center on the, on, the, uh, on the potter's wheel, the centrifugal force will pull the clay in all directions and instead of forming itself into a nice little pot, it begins to get looped and it gets to get wobbly and then the centrifugal force pulls it apart. And at that point the potter will stop, pull the clay back together, maybe pure, pull out some of the in imperfections, little rocks or dirt or something that found its way into the clay, rework it, put it back on the wheel and start the process again with the, with the clay more pure and more centered. And that's exactly what Jeremiah watched. He says, the vessel he was working of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. Something about the clay uh, turned out to be imperfect, and the potter had to start over. And he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. I didn't really like the vessel that was being formed here anyway. <laughs> I'm going to take this opportunity to recreate this pot as seen, and it will be a better pot than it was before. The reworking made it better. And that's the point <laughs> that the Lord's going to say. The word of the Lord came to me saying, can I, can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? says the Lord, just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. I will recreate you if you will let me. I will rework you and you will be better than you were before. The Lord plans in our mortal probation that there will be two creations. The first creation born into mortality. Then as we stumble and fall as we will, we are then able to have a second creation. We are, we are lowered into the void. We come up out of the water and we're placed in the ark. In that ark we are covered with safety from the atonement. And in that ark we are also given a window to see afar off. To see and in doing so we are now reworked and we become like uh, the gods, knowing good and evil and knowing to prize the sweet and reject the bitter. That's what happens to those that have been recreated. So final question then is, are we willing to be recreated 
or do we stubbornly cling to painful or less healthy behaviors? This is the way I am, dang it, and I'm not changing. There's nothing wrong with me, and I, and I know I'm miserable, but I'm not willing to change, and so I'm just going to keep on stubbornly doing what I'm doing. Uh, I love this, this boy's look. It's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be miserable, and you can't take it away from me. And the Lord says, if, you're, if you'll just become meek and humble and willing to submit to all things, I'm going to make you better. And at some point, we have to get over our bad self and allow the Lord to take over and be in charge and, be the, and, and allow the potter to know better than the stubborn clay who wants to do its own thing. So, I bury my testimony that the Lord intends to recreate us and we can fight Him on it and be miserable or we can go with Him and be made into something much better. I pray we can get over that and be able to trust Him to make us to what He wants us to be. And I leave that with you in Jesus' name. Amen.